Welcome, people searching for an all-powerful key that, what? It's not key to time? It's episode 352 of Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 6th of May, 2020, and featuring the Keys of Marinus, written by Terry Nation, yes, the Dalek guy, and starring William Hartnell as the Doctor, Carol Ann Ford as Susan, Jacqueline Hill as Barbara Wright, and William Russell as Ian Chesterton. I'm your host for the evening, Randy Ronson McCulloch, and with me tonight is our technical director, Mad Matt Winchell. The world is a madhouse. Tim, the Enchanter Sheridan. May the Force be with you. And Thomas Fireheart. So that's where Jack Harkness got that device from. Uh, Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, has yet to watch the episode and is thus not with us tonight. He may come in late if he decides he wants to still show up and um, finishes in time. So how's everybody's week been? Eh, not too mm. bad. Outside of crazy, out, outstanding garbage from my personal stuff has been fine lately. Oh, my laptop has developed a short in its power cord. Oh, no. I have ordered a new one, but it won't get here till Friday. Which is better than the Monday they originally predicted. <laughs> I legit have an order of comic books that's in limbo in the mail right now. Probably because I went through New York. <laughs> My ours, Mine arrived in Kenosha, Wisconsin this morning. So it's apparently going to take it two days to get half a state. <laughs> Trying to figure that out. Yeah, I ordered mine from the East Coast, at least as far as I'm aware. And uh, it got caught somewhere. It's been there for weeks now. Yeah, um, the thing is, when you're when you're traveling from the coast to uh, the Midwest, you got to wait for one of those uh, mail semis to do a uh, to do a cross country trip. And as far as I'm aware, those are usually only like weekly. But if it's been longer than that, then there's something. Then there's some processing problems. Uh, actually, those semis run almost daily. But yeah, it's it's taking much longer than normal. The, the problem is, is that it runs daily, but it has to make periodic pit stops depending on which direction it's going. No, I meant more of the express. Oh, I don't, um, I don't know if it was yeah, the express there's, either. There's, so. there's usually a weekly express semi that goes from L.A. to Chicago and New York to Chicago. Hmm. And from there, they can distro at Chicago to Wisconsin. to Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, then I'm not sure where it's hung up. But I just know it was moving along the west, uh, east coast and all of a sudden it just got hang up and it hasn't moved. It could be that it's gotten to a warehouse that's currently shut down because of, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. I have contacted the company that ordered the stuff through, and they said they're going to keep an eye on it, too. All right. So on tonight's show, we have birthdays, news, not a lot of news. And some of it is stuff that we forgot last week because... Uh, it just didn't show up on our feed. Uh, then we've got some geek talk. I have a rant about something I saw in the news this week. Mm -hmm. Our episode summary, our review, our final thoughts, and our ratings. So let's get on to birthdays, shall we? Yay. Uh, first birthday we have is May 1st. And that is of Sacha Dawin, who plays the master currently, started last year. Mm-hmm turned 36 and i believe that's his first time we've recorded his birthday on this podcast yep well it's the mm. first time we've uh he's had a birthday since he started yep mm. on the same day as joanna lumley who played the 13th doctor in the curse of fatal death she turned 74 next we have a couple of honorary birthdays first is that of david suchet who played the landlord in the episode knock knock but it's best known as Hercule Poirot in Agatha Christie's Poirot uh, series. He turned 74. And the other one is Paul Darrow, who played Captain Hawkins in Doctor Who and the Silurians way back in 1971. Also played Tekker in Time Lash. Good old Time Lash. Best known <laughs> as Care Avon in Blake 7. Uh, he would have been 79, but he died last year at the age of 78. Uh, then we go to May 5th, and uh, the birthday of Richard E. Grant, who played the 10th Doctor in Curse of Fatal Death and the 9th Doctor in Scream of the Shalka, 
but finally got a canon role as Dr. Simeon in The Snowmen. Uh, he turned 63. And then finally, the same day is the birthday of Delia Derbyshire, uh, titled music arranger, the realizer of the Doctor Who theme. Uh, she would have been 83, but she died in 2001 at the age of 64. Mm. So happy birthday, Sacha, Joanna, David, Paul, Richard, and Delia. Moving on to our news section. Okay, uh, according to a recent issue of Doctor Who magazine, showrunner Chris Chibnall says that production of Doctor Who has not been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our writing and planning for the next series continues apace. Stories are forming, writers are writing, conversations keep going, plans continue to be hatched. Filming for Series 13 is not due to begin until September, and the series itself is not due out until 2021. So as long as things calm down by September, they should stay on schedule. If not, uh, they're going to have issues. Hmm. Yeah, September seems to be where really. everyone's taking it as a cool down time. Mm. Which is interesting, really, because it means that they were at least trying to not have a year gap again, but they might be screwed over by what's going on at the moment. <laughs> Well, they're technically are going to have a year. Yeah, well, no, technically not. But yeah, they're, they're, they're trying not to extend beyond the normal gap between yeah. seasons. Mm -hmm. It's it's good that they're thinking ahead because, yeah, that gap is becoming annoying for people that got used to it. You know, they used yeah. to do they used to do 26 half hour episodes a year <laughs> back in the six, uh, 70s and 80s. Um, hmm. Russell T. Davies managed it from 2005 to 2007, um, hmm. and to, or 2005 to 2008. Took one year off because of David Tennant's schedule, and then we had uh, series five, series six, a year apart, and then since then nobody can get their act together and try to make consecutive doctor who's a you know each year <laughs> oh man it would be nice if they if they knew ahead they were gonna have breaks like this again to do something like they did with tenants last year of just doing the odd special here and there mm -hmm. as something to tide us over i think they were i think they were acting around his theater commitments was that what was that was up that year um uh, i'm not sure it was something like that. He either was that or he had a movie he was committed to that finally got underway. Something like that. Either way, it was only so he could they could film these and then just space them out over a year. But regardless, uh, hopefully we'll see Doctor Who next year. We are seeing still a Christmas special this year. Yeah. Or holiday special somewhere in there. That's already in the can. So Yeah. yeah. Because all they're really doing at the moment is just the post-production, which is just continuing in isolation anyway. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on to the next article. Moving on, moving on. Former Doctor Who writer Paul Cornell wrote a couple of short stories for the watch-along of Human Nature, Family of Blood, dealing with the characters of Sister Mine, who the Doctor left trapped in mirrors... The first story involves Bernice Summerfield and is narrated on YouTube by Lisa Bowerman. The second, narrated by sister of mine, actress Lauren Wilson, has her meet Jodie Whittaker's 13th Doctor. What happens? You'll have to listen to find out. I didn't even know about... The, that, that news is actually a week old. I didn't even know about it till this week. Hmm. Weird. I was like... Yeah, I was like... Really? And then I listened to a, the the first one's really short, like two minutes. And then the other one's like four minutes. <laughs> it's not as, they weren't as heart jerking as like the farewell to Sarah Jane was. Mm. That that really mm. got me choked up. But this one, I was just like, eh, that's nice. Done. <laughs> All right. So we're moving on to big finish news, which is all we have left because there is no other news. <laughs> um, 
Ace is about to literally blow her mind in the latest short trip directed by or uh, narrated by Sophie Adred. Aldred. Ugh, can't talk tonight. In it, the Seventh Doctor's trip to a war-torn world accidentally winds up with Ace infected organic cortex bomb capable of destroying the whole planet. Can the Doctor find a way to defuse it before it goes off? Doctor Who Short Trips Dead Woman Walking is now available to download from BigFinish.com for just $2.99. Also out, the Paternoster Gang returns for a third Big Finish outing. Three new adventures starring Neve McIntosh as the Silurian detective, Madam Vastra, Ketrin Stewart as her wife, Jenny, and Dan Starkey as their son, Tarn Butler Strax. These episodes include Family Matters by Lisa McMullen, Whatever Remains by Robert Valentine, and Truth and Bone by Roy Gill. The Paternoster Gang Heritage 3 is now available to own as a collector's edition box set or download exclusively from the Big Finish website for just £19.99. Pence. Uh, and finally, as we've been mentioning the last few weeks, Big Finish has decided to give people something to listen to while they're on lockdown. Every Monday, a new story or episode from a box set collection will be made available to download exclusively from the Big Finish website's weekly deals page. These stories can be unlocked by anyone who has a registered or who has registered for a Big Finish account, which is free to create, and played on the Big Finish listening app, which is free to install. Each story will be available for one week only and comes accompanied by a special discount offer on related titles. This week's free title is Jenny, the Doctor's Daughter, Stolen Goods, part one of the uh, Jenny, the Doctor's Daughter audio, written by Matt Fitton and starring Georgia Tennant as Jenny. And that's all the news we have this week. All right. So next up on the docket is the Geek Talk. Yeah. First, we got three mm-hmm. items from uh, Thomas. So, Vertigo. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'd meant to see a screening of this like a year or two ago, but never got the, wasn't able to get a lift. So I had to skip it. Um, it's, I meant to watch it like another at least once or twice again before talking about it today, but I didn't get the chance. Um, and it's weird because I'm I don't know entirely what to <laughs> what to think about the movie because it's just I feel like for one thing it almost feels a bit too long in parts. Like I can deal with movies that are like slow build but when it gets to a certain point the th- like the third act is kind of just like uh this could be short <laughs> and also the ending just made me laugh because i was like wait that's it that's what you're gonna end on okay <laughs> um but yeah i i would say of the hitchcock movies i've seen which admittedly isn't too many i've seen like Psycho, this, North by Northwest, Rear Window, I think that's it. You've never seen The Birds? Um, um, surprisingly, no. Um, oh. I've meant to, but I just haven't got around to it. Um, Have you thought but, this movie the, was slow-paced? I think The Birds is the only one that ever came on TV ah, while Bill. I was watching. Bill. <laughs> like... Um, yeah, like, of, of the ones I've seen... Hi, Bill, let probably... me turn you down slightly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like, of the of the Hitchcock movies I'd seen, I would rank this, like, my least favorite, but it's more so, like, just because it gets... It's just kind of like, oh, great. It's not, like, it's not like watching... it's a bad movie, it's just that, to you, it doesn't feel like he's on his end game, essentially. Mm, I, like... I f- it's one of those things again where it's like on repeat watchings I could I my opinion would probably improve but it it's will. also just cuz sometimes the soundtrack sounds a bit too much like it's trying to make things that are very clearly not romantic sound romantic and I'm like this third act is just him like turning this woman into 
the woman that he wants and it's just extremely uncomfortable and it's supposed to be but the music almost makes you think that it's not supposed to be uncomfortable so it's like okay what <laughs> case of composer um, may not have gotten it yeah like there are definitely bits where it's just like fuck i just feel sorry for this woman that, <laughs> that, like, that or he maybe he was trying to clockwork uh, orange him <laughs> and generally jimmy stewart is it's funny i'll give jimmy stewart credit he does actually pull off like what he's got to turn into in the third act fairly but, well. But does he give a monologue time. about sand? <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Bill. <laughs> Sorry, ev um, everything he said was making me think Attack of the Clones, so I just had to get it out. Uh, um, yeah, like, it's, it's not a bad movie by any means, and I own it on, like, to watch it for the first time, I own it on Blu-ray. I don't see myself necessarily just going ah fuck it someone else can have it or anything but yeah <laughs> um i like yeah my opinion may improve with further watchings but for now it's just like eh i don't hate it by any stretch but you know i just like kind of lukewarm on it for now um so moving on to the wicker man which to clarify is the original not the nicholas cage mess no bees um which I haven't seen, but I've seen enough clips of the remake that I'm like, I don't even know if I want to watch that to laugh at it. Um, oh, no. The original... I think it's worthy of a laugh at, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, the original... This is a case of this is like a slow pace as well, and I know where this is leading because I've, I've seen the ending before. Um... But even then, thankfully, the movie is just that good, at least to me, that I it didn't matter that I knew where this was going from the start. Because um, the performances are just great. Um, I was specifically... Well, yeah, it has freaking Christopher Lee in it. Mm. And I was watching the final cut, so this actually had slightly more Christopher Lee in it, because there were certain... There's still that portions of it missing, as far as I'm aware. Oh, yeah, yeah. But this is, like, kind of the most... This is apparently... Like, this the is the most is restored version they can get, yeah. Yeah. Like, they, they showed clips in, like, one of the behind-the-scenes docos about it, where it's like, oh, well, this was clearly um, a scene that's lost, and they only have this tiny bit of it. So having the rest of it would be a bit much. And this final cut was approved by the original director as well, as far as I'm aware. Um, Did I ever you tell, tell you guys that my father was a huge Hammer Studios uh, addict? So I actually kind of grew up mm. with Christopher Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Christopher Lee before I knew Bella Lugosi. Mm. Oh. Mm. Because it's funny that you bring that up because it's it's always funny to find out that Christopher Lee primarily did this movie and was willing to work on it for basically nothing because he wanted to escape the typecasting of playing Dracula all the time. <laughs> um, and George Lucas one day is just like, would you like to play a count? <laughs> would you like to play an evil count? <laughs> You're not getting uh... better. Would you like, would you to, like play to play count with, count, count with powers? <laughs> Still not improving, George. <laughs> okay, your name begins with the letter D. Oh, for bloody hell. <laughs> uh, well, at least he got the sweet lightning out of his fingers. Um, okay, that's new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not missed. Uh, <laughs> Um, Did we mention the glowy blade? <laughs> uh, I'm no um, amused. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like it's funny though because like for as much of a reputation as Christopher Lee has for this movie, it's funny realizing that he's kind of barely in it. Um, and even with like he's even like if you're watching the theatrical cut he's in it even a hell of a lot less because a lot of the cut scenes involved him even briefly mostly and you can tell you can tell if it's a cut scene because like the the 
uh, the image is very clearly rougher than the rest of the movie. <laughs> um, I feel like I've seen other movies where that's been the case as well, where they've reinserted old stuff that they've been able to find, and it just looks in rougher condition. Um, but yeah, this is it's the damn good horror. It's so funny because the the most like as the movie's going along, I'm thinking, God, you know, this community looks like it'd be really fun to be in. I mean, yeah, there's the human sacrifice shit, but aside from that, they seem pretty chill. <laughs> Um, outside of so just like murdering this everyone fun. this seems like an otherwise <laughs> okay community because <laughs> it's basically like a, a hippie it really could be into the mouth of hell <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know that's yeah, kind of like watching the purge movies and going you know society's pretty cool except for this whole purge thing <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, to be fair, the cop's also being an asshole the whole time to the point that it's so funny. I'm just laughing at him when he's trying to plead, plead at the end. But he's also just being like, "God, don't you know your whole religion is fucking stupid? You should be Christian like me." And it's like, <laughs> "Dude, you're not helping yourself." <laughs> uh, I'm so going to like roast it's... you alive. I think. <laughs> no. Yes. Um, no. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Definitely roast yeah, you alive. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I would. Definitely suggest horror fans check this out. If you can get your hands on the final cut, it's on Blu-ray. That's how I got it. Um, I think even YouTube has like a rentable version of the final cut. It would not wrong. surprise me. Um, but yeah, however you can find it, I would definitely say track it down and watch it. It is damn good. It, it to me, this is one of those ones where I was afraid it might not live up to its reputation, but honestly, oh, no, I enjoyed no, no, no. the hell it's, out of it. It's a slow burn, but it's a really good slow burn. Mm. And Mr. Lee, did we tell you your final scenes are going to be a sword fight against a hand puppet? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not so new for me. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, moving on from that to the Babadook, which... It was so funny at first watching this because I realized, oh shit, this is the the act. I can never remember her name, but the actress who plays the mum in the Babadook was uh, Miss Fisher in Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, which is an Australian sort of Agatha Christie style uh, detective series, and it's just like, holy crap! It's so weird seeing. Like this actress who I'm used to as that character. We should point this... out that this particular movie never got a United States release. It didn't? Mm -hmm. ah. No, it's only been it went if it did, it was it was at Sundance and it was released in Australia. Oh, it's it a theatrical was... release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I remember something about that, but yeah, like for some reason they couldn't managed to get whether it's just they couldn't afford to or they weren't given the money to or no yeah one picked it, up, I don't know. it was released here on video ah mm -hmm. i do remember but there were so many first. memes about it i kind of assumed it was a netflix original no it was originally <laughs> a shout factory uh blu-ray dvd release here which means that but, it might be on their streaming service because i don't think they have a big one yet but i think they might have some stuff up for streaming mm -hmm. Or not Shout Factory, mm -hmm. excuse me, Scream Factory. So, no, it's not going to be Shout. Scream Factory, the, 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 gotcha. the, the horror faction of Shout Factory, yeah. Ah, okay. But, yeah, mm -hmm. um, it never got theatrically released here, though. So Does that mean there's, mm -hmm. like, a, a Squeal Factory and a <laughs> Giggle Factory? I'm not sure. I just know that the horror division apparently uh, got big enough that they decided to make a separate division for it. Hmm. Um, yeah, in any case, it's also that's it's mainly interesting to note because this movie had a budget of two million and it made over ten. So for a movie that's made in Australia that was only re released in Australia, that's a damn good take of money. Yeah, <laughs> because... I just I just wanted to to put that out just in case people are going, what the yeah. hell is this? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, um, yeah, it's relatively popular. At least in the horror circles, it's relatively popular mm -hmm. for some reason or another. Yeah. I, I mainly know it from the memes of being a gay icon. <laughs> yeah, that was awkward. Uh, well, that was more like people were like 
make doing it as like I, a, I think it started off as a mistake and people just ran with it. I, it started off as yeah. a mistake, people ran with it, then they coupled him with Pennywise, and then Pennywise killed some gay guys, and then immediately everyone went, ooh. Yeah, no, it was originally a joke on Tumblr. Mm. Yeah, I, I and think then some people took it too I, seriously. <laughs> I think they said before that, um, the joke came about because one of the streaming services... Netflix. Um, recommended it poorly it was netflix okay because it's it's not showing up as available on netflix anymore so i i thought maybe my memory yeah. was faulty it like yeah it apparently but that is someone, a netflix thing to I, do uh, it's like oh you like gay movies here's a random movie that really has nothing to do with that okay that's where it came <laughs> from okay <laughs> yeah and then just people just kind of latched onto it because it was like yeah why not um but yeah honestly this is this is a damn good movie, but this is intense. Especially, like, the first third. The kid... The kid's kind of funny as well, because the kid is annoying as fuck in the, like, first half. But then it's, like, a flip where the more insane his mum gets, the less, like, over-the-top the kid is. So, <laughs> by then, he's, like, fairly... Uh reserved so it's just like oh okay you're not as annoying now um i have to assume you know it's it's not a great comparison if i'd seen a hell of a lot more horror movies and stuff i could probably make a better comparison but the comparison that came to mind for me is that this is almost as if the Shining was set in the suburbs of Australia, and it was the mum who went nuts instead of the dad. Um, and of course, like more blatant supernatural shit going on. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, especially this was like the the woman who directed this. This was her first uh, film uh, directing job, as far as I remember. She'd, like, maybe done shorts before then, but had not done, like, a feature film. Um, uh, but yeah, like, this was, aside from the annoying kid, which was just like, ah, fuck. Um, this was a damn good movie. Like, I would definitely, uh, recommend people check this out if you haven't seen it. Um, I do feel like the I almost kind of like the illustration depictions of the Babadook more than the actual like physical depiction you see a few times. But other than that, it's just like, um, other than that, I enjoyed this movie. Alrighty. All right. So next up is gaming. So that means it's going to me for one thing here. Um. I wanted to get to this a couple of weeks in a row, but I keep forgetting to list it until today. So <laughs> I finally finished uh, Final Fantasy three. I got nearly done with it way back in like 2006, 2007, but never finished it all the way. So this was my first attempt uh, to complete it and get done with. Um, it is a updated version of a 1990 NES release, which only uh, appeared in Japan, so it was only for the Famicom. Um, and the major difference, uh, there's a couple of minor major differences between the versions, as far as I'm aware. One is that they gave the main characters, I don't know if they had names already, but they gave them more personalities. So they kind of come off more like the Final Fantasy V characters. Uh where they can be any class, but they have uh, certain characteristics about them. Um, but the other big thing is, too, is that the originally Final Fantasy III uh, for the NES was never released for American NES because mm -hmm. the developers, Squaresoft, uh, the releasers of Squaresoft in America, decided that the game was too hard for people over here. They made this freaking game harder. <laughs> When they release this version, there's a lot of games that they release it in Japan, and then they're like, "Yeah, it's too hard for Americans." <laughs> uh, by the way, you know whose job it was to figure that out? Hmm. Do you remember Howard Phillips? The name sounds vaguely familiar. I do. He not. was president of the Nintendo Fun Club. Mm. 
Oh. Um, if you had early Nintendo powers, his animated persona was in the comic strip Howard and Nestor. Mm. Okay. I I never but had Nintendo was, power was, until he, he, um well, until the Dolphin was the big news, mm. which I believe became the GameCube. So yeah. <laughs> but um, he was also uh, head of Nintendo mm. quality control. So he was the uh, one that decided it was too hard. <laughs> He was the decide. He was the one that decided certain games shouldn't be released over here, because they would be too hard. Another one that he uh, nixed was uh, the original Super Mario Brothers two. Mm -hmm. That 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 was kind of what popped into my mind when I said a lot of Japanese games have that seem to have that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, but the major reason why the difficulty is ramped up for this version of Final Fantasy three is because at least in the original version of Final Fantasy three. Bosses could have done like massive big group attacks, but they could attack only once per round. Uh, uh, the enemies in the main boss enemies in this game not only can attack multiple terms per round, but occasionally they'll actually pull out their big spells twice in one round and just obliterate everything. So you have to be really hot on your uh, heal game and always have someone who can cast white magic in this game. Because you're going to need to spam the group heal. Um, other than that, uh, it, it was a relatively solid game. Uh, it was kind of interesting that it starts off on a floating continent and expands out from there. Um, also, I will say that uh, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be at first. But it was uh, kind of on the edge playing for uh, retro games. All considering because the final act of the game sets you up. Literally in a dungeon where you have to fight five bosses. Um, and then that, that fifth boss is the final boss, and it's your second attempt at it, because the first attempt at that boss is a auto-kill uh, for a story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I'm not going to give away all the plot details. I'm going to say, though, that what was there was really interesting, especially considering this is still, like, early... JRPGs. It was a pretty decent plot, even though it starts off pretty thin. Things keep accumulating and stuff keeps tying together until the point where you're just like, oh, okay, so this is like threatening a whole lot of shit all at once. Okay, uh, this is kind of making it a little more epic by the time you finally reach the end. Um, and uh, yeah, I was quite happy with how it ended. I'm, I was thrilled to play through it, and right now I'm playing the independent, uh, uh, uh RPG that's kind of styled after JRPGs, and uh, hmm. if things progress with that as they uh, ha are currently have been so far, I might be done with that in the next week or two. It's a much shorter game. Uh, I managed to actually beat Final Fantasy 3 here within 26 hours of gameplay, and uh, from what I'm told by other people who have completed both the NES game and this version of the game, I came in under level. Most people had to grind to sixty. I gave, I beat it in fifty eight. Nice. Hmm. And any good super bosses left to fight? What do you mean? The uh, the optional bosses that are usually like much stronger I, than the final boss. I actually don't think they had many uh, side bosses. If they did. Hmm. I think there's I, only I like maybe that... one side boss, but he's kind of rigged up in a, mm. in a way that you can't really fight him when you're supposed to because he'll just gotcha. flat out murder the team, and that's part of the plot. I, mm. I do remember hearing that for Final Fantasy One and Two, they um, when they re-released it, they went back and added extra super bosses. Yeah, when, when they released those, me, which they makes added me more think stuff. they weren't really, which makes me think they weren't really a thing back at at the time that the first few were being released. Um, went by two? Do you mean Final Fantasy Four? No, Final um, Fantasy 2, 2. The original that was supposed to be for also for NES. No, I was asking Bill. Because I know I know the re-release for Final Fantasy 4 had additional bosses, but most of them were only available. It might have been 1, 2, and 4 that I had heard. Because I, I haven't act Like, I've played 1. I never haven't finished it. I've never played 2 or 4. So yeah, I've read when people bosses. say names, like, the names don't mean anything to me at this stage. Um, but I... Yeah, generally just... Uh, when videos talk about super bosses in like Nintendo era Final Fantasy games, they usually say it was added to like the Game Boy Advance version or the PlayStation version or whatever. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, this port for for Final Fantasy 3, which originally came up for the 3DS in 2006, 
as far as I'm aware, they didn't actually add that much extra. They kept it pretty mm. straightforward still. Um, that being said, there's a lot of classic stuff in here. Chocobos are pop up periodically. Um, uh, I think this might have been the first. If it, if it didn't appear in number two, this is, I think, the first appearance of bombs as a monster race in Final Fantasy. Hmm. Um, I don't think there's a lot of other bosses that crossed over. Which is weird because I uh, I think it was Gilgamesh, isn't that one that appears frequently now? The the one the multi weapon guy. Is that his name? I'm not I keep sure. forgetting. Anyway, there's this guy that's been popping up since like number five that's got like multiple weapons. Oh, yeah, that's Gilgamesh. Yeah, that's yeah. It is Gilgamesh. Uh, I, this felt like a game that he could have appeared mm -hmm. in, but they didn't, as far as I'm aware. So. I know they retroactively added him to one of the older games, but I don't know which one. I think I'm not sure about two. This one, I know they didn't add that much extra to it. The, uh, they just made it finally be a release. And I think one got like an extra side dungeon for each major dungeon, for each of the four major dungeons. So I think Gilgamesh might have slipped in through there for number one. And I'm not sure about two. But um, yeah, this is a relatively straightforward game still. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I will say there was one hiccup that bothered me during the game, which is that they released a patch as I was playing it, and it broke the text boxes, so suddenly dialogue was really hard to <laughs> read for a while, for like a week or two, and then they finally fixed it again by the time I was in the uh, last third of the game. Mm. Not All sure right. what, I'm not sure what they did there, but at least they fixed it. <laughs> Oh, that's right. They were updating the UI because the UI was really ugly when I started. It's like, this is kind of ugly, but at least it's usable. All right. And that's the end of what you have to say about that's, that? That's all I have to say about Final Fantasy III. Solid edition. I'm, I'm all not right. done. <laughs> all right. We take it back to Thomas. Yeah, uh, yesterday... I f it would have been like an early evening. I finally got through uh, the entirety of uh, Critical Role's first campaign, which I have been on and off watching since... My God. It was <laughs> either 2018 or 2017. I forget. So I, I thought yeah, you were going I, I, to say I, something like 2015 or. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, you've been watching you've been watching Campaign One for as long as they've been into Campaign Two. Just about. Pretty much. Yeah. Um. Actually, yeah, I think it would have been 2018 because I feel like they were definitely into Campaign Two before I started watching Campaign One, but I still just wanted to watch Campaign One first anyway. Um. Uh. But yeah, it's it's interesting because this was the second of these of this kind of thing that I had watched, but this is just longer because uh, I try I'd been watching a uh, specific Wizards of the Coast affiliated one um, that had a two hour time slot on their Twitch channel to do, so I caught up on that very quick. And then moved over to Critical Role. Um, it's funny because I'm so fuzzy on their earlier stuff just because of how long it took to watch. Um, but I did enjoy the hell out of this. Uh, the closer to the end. I, I know that within the last week or two, there have been stuff that's like hit me right in the gut. Or, um, there was something like there was at least one or two moments yesterday where it wasn't full blubbering mess crying, but there were tears, and it was just <laughs> like, God, it's like, you know, in the other thing that happened once or twice, and that was more surprising because that was more like YouTubers, not full on voice actors like this. Um, I mean, part of, part of it's their actors, and also part of it's they give a shit, because this is a campaign that they've been doing for years before Critical Role started. And I think it was, like, five years total when they finished Campaign 1. Um, 
so like yeah they've been like playing that. for like three or so years before critical role and then like depending on how you fudge it like two to three years um with the start of critical role but yeah um don't really want to go into spoilers but i will just say that i do like a thing that i did like was um god i can never remember his name uh but he's in a screenshot that i posted in general um the guy from napoleon dynamite was a guest at one point for like Mm. two episodes i think and i liked how him and i think there were a few other guests they had who were into the idea but weren't really they weren't D D people like they'd either never played or played like maybe once um and like he was sitting between sam regal and Talison and jaffe and both of them but primarily talents and were like guiding him through everything but without being like dicks about it so it was like oh that was nice to see um that they like weren't getting frustrated with this guy who knows fucking nothing about what's going on. Um, Happens once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I feel like one of the most emotional points for me was probably something involving the character Sprig and people who know that would know what I'm getting at, but I'm probably I mean, I'm not going to go any further into that. But yeah, especially when you find out the the real world backstory behind that character even being included at all is mm. quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm glad I watched it, but I am taking a break before I start campaign two because holy shit, there's so much other stuff I want to catch up on, and this is such a time sink. Like if I didn't have more free time than most people, because I at the moment only work like two days a week. So I was able to watch multiple episodes a day and like do nothing else, basically. <laughs> yeah, once <laughs> actually when it's through. regularly airing, I have to say I'm very happy that it only airs once a week. <laughs> My free time um, out the window. <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah, I'm probably gonna like wait maybe a month or two before I start campaign two, but I definitely am glad that I watched this because not only has Critical Role and another like the Wizards of the Coast D&D thing that I was watching um made me want to give D&D a shot even though you know it's funny because I remember seeing people go oh well don't get your hopes up that it's gonna be as good as Critical Role for you personally I'm like oh yeah I know that (laughs) it really did about the players yeah, it's yeah, really about like, the group that you get around you. Yeah, it's one of those things of like, well, yes, I'm not going to be doing this with fucking, you know, highly sought after voice actors who can do <laughs> all these voices and are like, you know, I've been doing both D and D and acting for this long. It's like, yeah, I'm not expecting to get a group like that. Um, but on top of that, it's also just. I mean, one, it's, I've said it before off podcast, but it is it has inspired me generally to make a fantasy project that I've been on and off working on for, since like 2010. Like, more friendly to this kind of stuff. Because at first it was just like typical Lord of the Rings fantasy type shit. And then the the more I watched this sort of stuff, the more I was like, you know what? A, this would actually help in some respects. And two, this would just be interesting to make this more tabletop RPG friendly. Um, so that's going to be interesting when <laughs> I get back into doing stuff for it because it has periodically made me write more stuff. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, it's funny because as someone who gave no fucks about D&D Pry, like I didn't have anything against anyone who was into it, but it was just like, I don't know what this is, so I don't have an opinion on it. And after watching these things, I'm just like, shit, where the fuck were people who were into this when I was a kid? <laughs> I feel robbed. <laughs> yeah, I on, I, on the other hand, feel blessed. I've had a really nice group of gamers around me since the mid-90s. Mm. And... You did it. You did it, didn't you? 
Mm. And they're a really good group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, Even though our main campaign is on break right now because of social distancing and a couple Mm. of our players didn't want to join us on Discord, we're still having fun. We're actually starting a sequel now to our to uh, our old Monday group's uh, superhero game. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going back to Emerald City. I'm just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you have a group that does that, and we start talking about going back to an old campaign, and the rest of the night is just full of you talking nostalgia about that game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm hosting the Conan game every other week. Mm-hmm. And mm, I'm looking forward nice. to that. <laughs> I, I've, I've been slowly converting all the Conan monsters to D&D. It's been like, what do I do with this one now? <laughs> <laughs> I need to come up with stats for a mammoth. Quickly. <laughs> there's not a mammoth in, D- in the monster there manual? Should, there should be one. In one of, I don't know if there's there, one in the current 5th edition. I know mm-hmm. there was one in the old 2nd edition. I'm I'm sure there's got to be at least an elephant or something. But I know the old second edition mo- monster manual was like 200 pages long. Yeah. <laughs> and like five and that, monsters. And that's a page. true. My my first thought is 3.5, but 3.5 had so many source books that there's well, you could not. I'm, I doubt you could think of a concept in fantasy that wasn't in some 3.5 or Pathfinder. Well, book. Okay. 3.5. Oh, <laughs> that's 3.5. We got to extend it after a while. Yeah. Or th- uh, or just 3e or yeah. <laughs> here's the thing. Second edition had all these things called monstrous manuals, volume one, volume two, volume three, mm-hmm. about all this. Eventually, they came out with one called the monster manual, which was all of it put together in a big thick ass book. <laughs> It was freaking huge. So much so that when Third Ed came out and they showed the Third Ed Monster Manual, I'm like, that's fucking tiny. <laughs> but then there was Monster Manual 2, Monster Manual 3, Monster Manual 4. Yeah. <laughs> they sequelized it instead of compounding it. <laughs> For the same. Now, now, the old, now, what they did with the old one, which I thought was cool, was the fact that the Monster Manual came in a binder. Oh, so that every are, time a new good, volume yeah. came out, you could then take it and piece it into the binder. Yep, those those, those are always good. But then you can't mm-hmm. you you don't get those uh, those forty dollar bulk sales. I mean, I guess you could. You could do a, <laughs> well, a you do a starter pack, and then you do little bundles of different. Uh, this was before the forty dollar bulk sales. Mm-hmm. This was back in the nineties. And the I'm 80s. Say, I'm, say, I'm saying that's in terms of why a company wouldn't want to do it now. They'd rather sell a forty dollar book or a hundred dollar compendium. Well, than... yeah, that that's that's more of the wizards' policy. This was TSR. Mm-hmm. They actually just thought more of what they would want to do if they were gamers, which might be why they went out of business. But we won't <laughs> talk about that. Frowny face. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I will say just before we move on that, out of curiosity, I did actually pull out. The monster manual that I bought, <laughs> and there is a mammoth in there. Aha! <laughs> and that's a fifth edition one, so yeah. Yes, uh, the the group <laughs> is currently heading to the northern steppes of Hyperborea. It is time to <laughs> blow, roll out the frost monsters. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, there's a lot of the monsters for fifth edition are online. If you go, if you typed up like uh, in the Google search, mammoth five e. Yeah, can I can find, find stats pretty for pretty easily. Yeah. The question is, I gotta find stuff that's Conan appropriate for this region. Mm. Yes, but again, Mammoth Five E. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, unless Conan has some weird animals, I would think any mammoth would do. Uh, a mammoth is a mammoth is a mammoth. A mammoth. <laughs> we need uh, we need frost tigers. Uh. <laughs> Don't know if those are in there, but you probably can find frost giants. Mm-hmm. I'm, oh yeah, or like, I need, I need to look up. Or there's actually, probably like a di- there's probably like a dire tiger that you could convert. I have to double to a check where tiger. the frost. I have to double check where the frost giants are. I think there's actually a select location for them. I have to double check. I think they're located between Hyperborea and Asgard. When I think about it, mm, I think it might be just northern uh, north of Asgard. But well, again, I'll have to double check it. Anyways, <laughs> anyway, moving sad, on. Sad ramble. Yeah, we've gone <laughs> off a bit. Yep. <laughs> so I have a rant this week. Yes. As you may know, as I have said a few times here, 
because of looking for Doctor Who news, I have subscribed to a lot of British newspapers, tabloids, uh, so that I can get this news. Um, however, that means, of course, I get all their regular news. One of the things that came up in my news feed this week is the fact that with um, things lightening up in Italy, they're lightening down, they're, they're lightening up their lockdown procedures. And some of their restaurants are reopening, but have been made more friendly to uh, try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This is what they came up with. And I'm going to cross post this in the channel so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. Now take a look at this. And would you really want to eat in a place like this? <laughs> It'd be kind of like eating in the Pope mobile. <laughs> yep. I mean, as somebody who normally eats alone, I would personally have no problem with it. But I mean, when, when I eat at a I, diner, I'm, a... I'm kind of like in a cubicle like that almost anyway. I'm a big well, man. I can't mm -hmm. stand these little cubicles. <laughs> yeah, I'm even bigger mm -hmm. than Matt. So yeah, that that would like trigger mm -hmm. my claustrophobia. My I'd be constantly mm -hmm. banging my elbows oh, on these. That's things. true. Yeah, the uh, depending on how close they are to your elbow, that could be an issue. They're bigger, um, barely wide enough for the chairs to sit in front of them for crying out loud. But if you take a look at the lower right hand picture, does that remind you of anything? All it needs is the little phone, and it'd be like eating in the prison prisoner visiting booth at the at the at the local supermax. Right. <laughs> also Bruce reminds me of always... Maxwell Smart when they tried the uh, yeah. soundproof dome. <laughs> the yeah, that's the cone of silence. <laughs> I have one problem, Chief. What's that? I can't hear yeah. you. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is mm -hmm. kind of. You know, the thing about eating at a restaurant is ambiance. I mean, that's you. There's three things: there's food, mm -hmm. service, and ambiance. And if you rate above an average in any of those things, you're not going to go want to go back. Mm -hmm. If the service is fast, the ambiance is okay, but the food is crap. No, you're not going to eat there again. Nope. Mm -hmm. If the food is good, the ambiance is okay, but you had to wait two hours to get your order taken and another two hours for your meal. Ah, uh, hell no. Fuck no, mm -hmm. ain't coming back. Um, and there's which, with with those in place, you would pretty much have to move out of the way so they could actually put your stuff down on the table. In front yeah, of you. yeah, that's true. You're not um, really <laughs> staying socially distant. Yeah, at you, that point. you still have to social distance out of their way, and you could be socially distancing into mm. somebody else. No, this is stupid. Yeah, see that that's where the logical <laughs> thing to do would be to you know cut the amount of chairs in half, <laughs> and that way there's enough space for all of that and still to do things properly. Now, um, like I said, there's a restaurant here in Madison that Aaron and I ate with at last year. Um, it was a Cajun restaurant. We ate there on her birthday. The food was really good. The service was nice and prompt. But the fact that they had two people playing crappy versions of cover songs at max volume that I couldn't even hear other people in the table. Ugh. Yeah, we haven't eaten there since and we have no plans to go back there again. So, and that's a place where ambiance fails. These are ambiance killers. Yeah, this is really, plas this is a plastic dome of my emotions failure. This is like eating in a vault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I, I get, I, like I get the impression just from the way that picture is staged that this is for like people who are like, oh my god, I need to get back to Tinder dates, and yeah. they haven't, you know, like they. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't been able to get back to their Tinder addiction. I'm sorry, now, the, the look in that lady's eyes in the bottom right just says, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> I, I feel like that's the look on most women's face during a Tinder date, though, so that works. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, you know, when I eat, I usually eat with members of my family. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they decided to divide, put dividers between tables for social distancing, I'd be okay with that. Mm. Yeah. But to divide up the table like this, no. I see. I can uh -uh. see that because, like, you can't. Like, right now, you can't really eat out with friends. But if they separated the table, you could. You could go back to eating out with friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and with this, you can't even eat that. Eat that. No, way. no. You're you're eating. You're eating in these little cells. 
<laughs> like a freaking like you know it's like freaking monastic eating <laughs> how's the fishy swas that, that was <laughs> uh, and, you know, nice, but my elbows you, keep you, bumping into you hit thing. that note perfectly by the way <laughs> <laughs> i've i've done that i i had to do that um at uh our our uh elementary school had a renaissance festival at one point i played the monk from monty python so i literally went halfway across middleton doing that did i've you, been able to hit, hit your head note. with a tablet i hit my head with a book which was the closest <laughs> thing i could find that wouldn't leave me of unconscious course. on the pavement are, what, um, are you saying that you, are you saying you didn't have granite tablets lying around your house no i did not <laughs> oh wow but um anyway um the other thing is when I eat out with Aaron, we tend to share an appetizer. Right. Try to freaking do that in this environment. <laughs> yeah, that's that's an excellent point. You don't even yeah. have the little like bank deposit like uh thing <laughs> yeah, under the window. You don't, you don't have slide. the little mat flap. Yeah. You you can't slide the ketchup. Oh yeah, I hadn't even thought about the condiments. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. There's no condiments on that. I I don't see any condiments there actually. Actually, so, I think you have to request them. Oh currently. no, wait those those bottles at every table might be I don't know because if if they're at every table, they might be like olive oil. Olive yeah, oil I think it's olive oil because no. this is supposed mm -hmm. to be like maybe an Italian restaurant or something. Well, it's in Italy. It's probably an Italian restaurant. <laughs> they just go. call it a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ah, uh, but um, no, this is a terrible idea. This is bad. Mm. This is take it back and think it over again. Yeah, it looks like something out of. Fittingly enough, it looks like something out of sixties Doctor Who or something. <laughs> if, if, if this is the future of dining, then fuck it. I'm eating takeout for the rest of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Just saying. I'm just going to be eating fast food out of a drive through the rest of my life. And by the way, the first one of you companies that can actually keep uh, workers that can actually get an order correct, you're officially hired. Well, you know what Joe Pesci says about that. Mm. They fucked you at the drive through They do that because they know by the time you're, you're, you figure out they've got your order wrong, you're halfway home and not coming back. That's why I'm demanding that every time we get drive through anymore, it needs to be checked before it comes home. I'm sick and tired of this. Either we I'm getting screwed on too. food or someone else is getting screwed on food. Enough's enough. Anyway, this is a terrible idea. Rethink it. This won't work. If this is the future of dining in America, dining doesn't have a future. Family restaurants are good dead run. across the nation. Yep. All right, that's my rant this week. I just saw this, and it's just like, no, no, God, no. All the nope sauce. Yep. All right. All right. So, so Tim, time for the time. song break. Oh boy, time for me to make my maker. All right, <laughs> starting in three, two, one, go. So the TARDIS crew land on a beach made of glass, surrounded by a sea made of acid. And they go to a building, and they meet this guy who says, I'm, uh, welcome to the planet Marinus. There's this big computer that, uh, decides what's good and evil, and it used to control everyone, but then these frogmen-type things, things, uh, broke free of its control, and now I need to find some keys to fix it. Can you find the keys? And the doctor says, no. And uh, the guy says, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to put a force field around your ship and I won't release it until you find the keys for me. So there. Yeah. And. The. Uh, but he's nice enough to give uh, Ian, Barbara, Susan and the doctor some nifty uh, uh, space traveling watches. So you just press the button and boom, you're at another place. Please. So. The doctor and his companions go off to find the keys, but then one of the frogmen who travel in glass submarines 
means uh sneaks up and kills uh the guy who uh told them to find the keys and that's where we begin and uh, the first place they look is this place where everything is hunky dory and you can have anything you ask for but it's actually a sham it's all an illusion uh uh in order to enslave the people by brains in jars. But uh, the hypnosis doesn't work on Barbara because her uh, her gem falls off her forehead and uh, she uh, hits the brain in the jars with a shoe. I, I think it's a shoe or it's something. And uh, they fall over and die and uh, everyone wakes up and they start crashing the place. But... Ian, Barbara, and the Susan, the Doctor, meet uh, two companions. Uh, the uh, old guy's daughter and her boyfriend, who had been sent out to for the keys first. <laughs> Before. Before. The next place they go to is uh, this temple that's surrounded by a bunch of vines and leaves and trees. And they find this guy who... Uh, has accelerated time so that the forest is uh, enveloping the uh, the temple at uh, an accelerated rate. Like forestation is uh, is uh, out of control. And but he says that uh, the key is in a jar with uh, chemical formula on it, and they find the key, and then they go to the next place. Uh, they're stuck in the On a wintry mountain, uh, they meet a guy who had stolen the keys from the other uh, people, but uh, then they force him to help him find the keys. They find the key in a big block of ice, and they cross the rope bridge. Uh, bridge. But then the four knights who were guarding the block of ice wake up, and... And they uh, attack the ghost guy shack, but the other uh, doctor and companions use their uh, magic wristwatches to uh, go to the next place. They're in a museum. Museum. Ian is framed for murder, but it turns out that it's actually the wife of the guard and uh, the prosecutor who framed them. Framed them, but the doctor figures it all out and. Uh, they go back to uh, the original place. They find that uh, the old man who had sent them on this wacky adventure to begin with uh, is dead. But Ian uh, gives him a fake key. So when he starts the machine, it blows up. And the doctor and his companions, uh, now that the force field around the TARDIS has been deactivated, they go off on the merry ways. And uh, the daughter and the boyfriend live happily ever after the end. Okay. Four minutes, 42 seconds. Golf claps, golf claps. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Bow before my uh, godlike knowledge of. I would not have been able to do that in under five minutes. I'm just saying. <laughs> and he had a pauses. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was gonna say, and, and Tim really goes into like every detail a lot of the time. So, <laughs> all right. So, let's talk about what you liked about this serial. And Matt, you are first. Oh, what I liked about this serial overall, I liked the fast pace of this entire serial. There was no waste of time on useless fluff whatsoever. Everything was there because something needed to be explained, or because they're building up to something. Just zero waste of time. There's no time to waste. We're on a uh, grand scale, across the planet adventure to try and collect these things and get back. All right, Thomas. Um, in a way, I kind of like the fact that they used the fact that this was a six episode serial to divvy it up by basically one or well, it is mostly one location per episode like we start episode one and six are then the same mostly 
but otherwise it's basically like one location per episode and that works out pretty well Mm -hmm. sort of like a little anthology story all right tim i really liked uh, the doctor uh performance in this episode and the way he used his wit to deduce what was going on around him and plan ahead but it also showed like him growing as the doctor like because this is a first uh, season one series isn't it uh yes this is uh mm-hmm. the fourth mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. like uh fifth he, excuse me he, fifth he's Zero. uh it, it shows that he's uh, growing a, a bit of a his hearts are growing three sizes that day you know <laughs> in a Wait, like he's that not, happens he's... real in real life. We need to go to a surgeon and get that checked out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's usually a sign of heart failure. Trust yep. me, I know. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, <laughs> yeah you would know. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. But, uh, but, yeah, he's a uh, he's growing more humane, I think, and this is a good uh, demonstration of that. All right, Bill. Um, right. So, yeah, so I, my choice was definitely, um, the one about, uh, that has already been taken about splitting it up into different, uh, stories. This was, this is very much, um, this is probably the closest you come in a long time to what modern who eventually would become of, uh, you know, kind of a different story every week. Um, I guess if since I have to go to a second choice, since I was kind of already taken, I think I'm going to go with, I really like the uh, uh, murder investigation slash courtroom drama episode. I thought that was done pretty well, even though it's, um, uh, I'm, 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 I was imagining the Legal Eagle YouTube channel that reviews um, court cases <laughs> based on how an actual lawyer would experience it. And I know he would find all sorts of things to uh, criticize about it. Um, but at the same time, looking at ig- ignoring real life, it uh, it does a job of that sort of courtroom drama murder investigation episode very well. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. That was my favorite of these. I also like the fact that they hit the concept of guilty until proven innocent. Mm-hmm. Rather than innocent until proven guilty. It really does throw things on in your head and try and figure out how this is going to proceed. Mm-hmm. Mm. And they did it better than even Star Trek has done it because Star Trek tried to do it with the Cardassians, but there with them it was yeah you're basically guilty. Uh, the trial is just for show. Here it's like no, we think you're guilty. Prove us innocent, or prove yourself innocent. Yeah. Mm. So I actually liked the fact that they did it more um, rationally than Star Trek did. So. All right, so let's talk about what we disliked about the serial, Matt. Uh, what I disliked about the serial, um, um, the uh, sets were really uh, a lot of the th- other things were really good and all, but I think some of the costuming was quite weak. In particular, our, our uh, two main guest companions for this episode never leave the weird rags we meet them in in episode two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he's walking around the freaking like snowfield with no pants. Yeah, the one guy's yeah, wearing I, like I, a I, the, like a man's toga mm-hmm. with no pants, and the gal is <laughs> still wearing this ripped up dress. And it's like, really, guys? I was thinking I... someone on set must have really liked that guy's legs because they wanted to show him off. <laughs> he's got nice yeah. thighs. I Keep was, showing them. Give them a of, shot. I was kind of amused by it because it's like it's it's just high but just low enough that it's like you just can't make out like whatever underwear they've given him as part of the outfit <laughs> it's like just almost there it's like one of those things where people will make fun of how some some mini skirts for women basically look like a belt with a bit of fabric <laughs> it's just like holy crap how is that not showing anything it's so freaking haha <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Thomas, what about you? What about your dislike of the whole thing? Um, oh. um, 
Oh god, I feel like I had something, but I... <laughs> um, god. Hmm. I guess like the fact that the Vords play like such a little role ultimately <laughs> is kind of like oh. And the irony of that was this was supposed to be a vehicle for the Vords to become a villain, uh, a, a villain for um, craze like the Daleks had become. <laughs> they they <laughs> and it obviously, tried to, but yeah. Yeah, that obviously didn't work. Yeah. Although it is funny that um, I think it was uh, Moffat that went back and uh, said that they were a version of the Cybermen or would become a version <laughs> of the Cybermen. When did he do that? In um, the... the uh, I'm forgetting the name of the story, but the uh, 12th Doctor finale, they were listing off um, different Cybermen origins, and he mentions the Vords as one of them. Oh, so Dr. Falls? Yes. Dr. Falls, and I think that's taken from a comic Actually, book, Actually, I think that might have been world enough. And, um, well, no, that, I, think, I think it was the one before that, but yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a two-parter, but the same, that, that story, yeah. I th I think the comic came after, but I'm not I'm not no I'm not the comic confident. the comic may have gone confident on that. No, even the comic was reprinted before then. The comic is like from okay. like Doctor Who magazine way back in the day. Uh, oh, okay. Because I know another comic about the Time War with the War Doctor used that concept like the following week or like the following. No, week this is like, like a uh, reprint when IDW first oh, got Doctor Who. Got you. So like maybe that. Moffat was Mo Moffat was probably referencing that then. Mm -hmm. What What were you saying? Uh, what were you saying, Matt? Uh, I was talking about uh, the 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 mag the the comic strip I was aware of that said that the Vords were going to be or were somehow tied to mm -hmm. the, the Cybermen. Yes, that was a the World Shapers was the comic. It was from Doctor Who magazine, mm -hmm. um, and was actually written by Grant Morrison. Hmm. So, uh, it, yes, the Grant Morrison of very big comics fame. He wrote for Doctor Who magazine. There and it yeah, is. that and that was yeah, and the whole that that whole thing. Uh, they began experimenting with something called the World Shaper. And that quick evolved them, and they started replacing themselves with cybernetic parts and turned into Cybermen. It was a six Doctor serial with Frobisher, Perry Brown, and Jamie McCrimmon. Yep, <laughs> yep, that's the one. I have that comic floating around somewhere. That's yep. my that was my introduction to Frobisher. <laughs> so yeah, that the reference gotcha. of using the Vords as Cybermen. Uh, so that's came... where Moffat got it from. Okay. Yep. Mafic yeah, uh, so, yeah supposedly they eventually became the Cybermen, and eventually the Cybermen, uh, supposedly, according to Time Lords, are intervening at the end of the story. The Cybermen will eventually become the most peaceful, peaceful race in the universe. You realize that does quasi-canonize that comic? Yep, that's now <laughs> that's uh, now semi-canon, which means Frobisher is running around the galaxy somewhere. <laughs> that's... That, that hurts my brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a season, the season for Doctor Who, where we're going to need a CGI penguin for like three episodes. <laughs> they can or, do it. Shit. They need, at least for um, Children in Need special. Like, maybe not, but like. Oh, yeah, bring back Frobisher for Children in Need special. <laughs> Frobisher as a Muppet, voiced by like Danny DeVito. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Voiced by Danny DeVito. It wouldn't be Danny DeVito. It would be somebody English, but it would be... Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right, but I don't know enough oh, I don't um, know enough English actors that way. Oh, Brain, his name. Why can't I think of it? Um, Brian Blessed. No. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no. Uh, that would Brian... be an interesting take. <laughs> Um, you know who might be interesting though if they ever decided to do that? Robbie Coltrane. I feel like I've heard the name. He was the guy that played Hagrid. Oh. Ah. Okay. He has that that deep kind of gruff tone, and that I think mm. would be would be interesting for them to do for Obisher. He doesn't have to do the same accent, but that gruffness I think would be mm -hmm. good. Mm. Um. Anyway, <laughs> I think we were now up to uh, Tim. Yes. So uh, 
least favorite things, right? Yep. Yes. Just like mm-hmm. overall. Overall. Uh, overall, there seem to be a lot of moments in this story where they just like gloss over like scenes. Like they they skip from like scene A to scene C. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like yeah. find the keys. Yeah. They immediately cut to the doctor, the TARDIS saying, "Hey, I can't get in." You know, it's like yeah, like yeah. You know, it's like, I, I noticed geez. that it's in episode one. It's like I'm suddenly watching. It's like when did the doctor and Barbara meet up? <laughs> it uh, just happened off screen. What the hell? Or, or like I blinked for a second, and next thing I knew, Barbara was in a different city, and the others were trying to figure out where she was. I was <laughs> all I did was blink. <laughs> and every time they used the freaking teleport dials, you never saw them arrive. They were already there. Yeah. Oh, uh, like there's once. In like episode, oh, where they go to the frozen, two? frozen north. Uh, yeah. Oh, like there's this the instance when like after Barbara leaves initially, then they then they show up, but like Barbara's been there for a while, uh. and then like Barbara and Ian, um, showing up on the the snowy area. Yeah, there's like it happens like twice out of like six episodes. <laughs> Every other one, they just yeah, they just turn up and they just cut um, scene and they... you're just like what <laughs> and i mean the one leading into episode five is the worst because apparently they had been there a while it's just like mm-hmm. yeah we're just gonna cut them give them a couple of days worth of trying to figure out shit and have this planned and then we're gonna cut into them just as the crime occurs yep mm. okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. That's it's 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 a little jarring, Tim. Mm-hmm. Okay, Bill, how about you? So I was originally thinking mine was a kind of a complaint about the serial as a whole, but even as I think it was Thomas was talking and things he liked, I realized that it didn't really apply to the serial as a whole. So it's mainly just one episode, which I think is the third episode, um, where it kind of seems like they just kind of gloss over, like they suddenly arrive. They go through a place, get a key, and then they're all of a sudden in another place. Um, and it just, like, it caused, a, like, this very inconsistent feeling where, you know, you spend, like, an episode an episode and a half in one location, and then all of a sudden you go through, like, two or three locations in one episode. And I think it kind of <laughs> stabilized out after that, but that, that was kind of uh, particularly jarring, especially with the transition issues we just talked about. Mm. All right. Yeah, my problem is also with a particular episode, but mine is episode two. Um, my main problem is with the hypnosis thing, um, because it was working on Barbara, and then they had to put discs on everybody, and because of that didn't work, it stopped working on Barbara. <laughs> and yeah, when she weird. woke up, she heard the weird sound. It's like, no, you needed to figure that out and write that a little better. Mm. Um. And then, of course, you had the uh, freaking brain slugs. Um, what did you call them, Thomas? The, the Gary the Snail. Yes. Gary. Um, yeah, I find most of that episode to be basically just uh, kind of uh, kind of not well written. Um. And yeah, where she's wrecking the jars, and she cra- she only manages <laughs> to break one jar, yet all of them, them all of them die. Mm. I'm like, because really? it's 60s Doctor Who, and we have no budget, so yeah, whoops, no no time for another for a do over. Yeah, it just it 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 just they bothered me. The whole concept of the hypnosis thing bothered me. The the, the also, crew guys must have sat there in the back going, "We really should have given her the bat." <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they also could have done a better job to note the differences between what Barbara was seeing and what the rest of the group was seeing. Um, but that would have needed them to take the to reshoot the same scene twice, one with the hallucinatory mm. vision and one with uh, real vision, which you know would have been done. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, just to just to show that if they were doing something like that now, that would have been done. But still. Um, and and it's funny too because this is the era when they're like, you mean we have a way to pad out an episode an extra fifteen minutes without really having to do much? Let's do it. <laughs> but they this story they did not choose to do that. Yep. <laughs> 
All right. Favorite scenes, Matt. Favorite scene. Um. Oh gosh. Uh, which one to stick on? Uh. I'm going to go with um the scene in the last episode where Barbara and the others are just about to leave. Um, we we found out we've been finding out through uh, cuts without the characters there that the uh, one officer's wife is actually part of the group trying to steal the last key, and it finally just dawned on Dar Barbara as they're about to leave. Oh wait, she called out the fact that we had gotten a car for, a call with uh, Susan that she's going that she's going to die if she if we tell them uh, where the hidden key is. We didn't tell her that, and no one else outside the officers that might have been in the area knew about it. And just the immediate scene afterwards of sneaking up on her and grabbing the gun away and everything else. <laughs> it's just like, I was actually legitimately about ready to call him on the, are you really going to walk away from that conversation? And she just said that, and immediately the game, movie, the, the show just literally stopped and went, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, thank goodness. <laughs> Hmm. Somebody's right. running on full cylinders today. <laughs> All right, Thomas. Um, even though it was discussed sort of negatively previously, I honestly liked the scene where they finally managed to wake Barbara up, and like it's just snapped off for her, and she's just um going like ranting about how it's you know clearly not what it was oh they've changed everything da, da, da. and i think part of it is just because there's something at least to me interesting about how one of the shots is just the dr barbara oh uh, sorry the dr ian and susan just staring at her like what do you want about this fine and then like susan's got the hey they gave me my dress and it's like because we're looking through Barbara's eyes, it's all torn up and shit, and it looks like crap. But Susan's just still like rubbing it against her face and all that. <laughs> yeah. And then the guy, yeah. and then the guy shows up, and it's clear that he's not exactly wearing the opulent thing it looked like he was wearing before. Just like something about that specific scene and the way it's shot, I really like. Yeah, I just wish that they would also have shot it where you saw it, saw it from the angle of the other ones. So you see her, so like you see, you see, you see Susan pick up the dress and it's beautiful. And then it cuts to seeing it through Barbara's eyes and she's holding rags, you know? Yeah. Cause there's a lot of like between shots. It'll shift over. Like there's when she's being picked up and dragged off, like it seems to switch back to how they're viewing it temporarily. So like the scene, like the sets back to the original, but there's no like, transition it seems like there's a bit of a wavy transition at one point but i wasn't sure if that was intentional or if that was just the aging of this or if wayne and garth went by going doodle -doo, doodle -doo, doodle -doo. yeah <laughs> all right uh tim how about you did we lose tim Sorry, I accidentally muted my mic. I was just um, about to say. Uh, uh, I, 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 I just loved the uh, the end of the brain slugs. <laughs> like, like uh, th they, they faced their death with such nobility. Like, kill her, kill her, kill her, kill her! And, <laughs> and uh... Barbara was really selling, uh, smashing the glass, you know, it was like, she was so powerful <laughs> that, uh, the glass at the end of the table broke before she even touched it. <laughs> you know? And the rest of them didn't budge at all. <laughs> she was trying her best. Just... Mm. Trying her best, the prop guys didn't really give her a good mallet. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise me if there was like a like a fan explanation where it's like well one died and they were like a hive mind or something so it killed the other two um. <laughs> all right but i just really loved that scene that amused me to no end 
I was imagining that scene as if it was being watched by the MST3K crew. <laughs> you take a shoe, and you take a shoe. <laughs> All right. Um, Bill. Uh, favorite scene? I would go with the scene of Barbara waking up and, like, everything is fucking wrong just because, like... It feels so like narratively jarring the whole scene before that with you like showing up and just like lounging out and being fed grapes and shit and like to have it like come to a head in a dramatic way where it's just like, okay, this is why the shit like happened. And it there's there's a satisfying feeling about that where it's just like, okay, you know, there actually is narrative sense still happening here. All right. So I think my favorite bit um, is in uh, episode five, and that's the doctor's great courtroom scene where he produces the mm -hmm. key and, and the guy basically <laughs> incriminates himself. Again. Again, yeah, because he had done that in front of them, but that wasn't admissible. But he manages to get him to blurt it out in court. <laughs> and that time he realizes he can't back out of it. He's just like, I mean, yeah. um, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb criminal. But still, it was it's just that great courtroom of reveal scene. The, the most easily bamboozled corrupt officer. Yeah, and it's it's just that. Um, just that courtroom drama. And yeah, I was kind of living for that when I was watching those episodes myself, the, the courtroom detective kind of CSI-ish kind of law and order-ish kind of thing. Hmm. All right. Least favorite scene. Matt. Oh, gosh. Least favorite scene. Oh, which one do I want to go with? Um... Uh, I'm going to go with the, uh, we're told that the, uh, eventually the chip would overload and then the, uh, big computer at the end is going to explode. I was really underwhelmed by the very sudden kaboom of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and there was only literally one room that blew up. It's like, I thought this was supposed to be a little more devastating, but okay. <laughs> it would have been in later se seasons of Doctor Who, but... When they had the budget mm. to actually blow up models. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, All yeah, right. the, so the, uh, yeah, the end, the end send-off was a little bit meh for the villains. They were also trying to rush to the end at that point, too. I suppose that's a possibility, too. Multiple We've already issues. done it. <laughs> we've got ten... We've got five minutes left. Come on. <laughs> Just plug it in and go boom. We'll flash a big bright light. <laughs> All right, Thomas, how about you? Um, uh, I probably had something else, but I'm just going to go for the... And there was one thing that I almost went for, but like something later um, kind of redeemed it. Um... But I'll just go with the thing where uh, the two guest characters are tied up back to back and then just sort of confessing their love for each other. I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? <laughs> like, this seems to come completely out of nowhere, at least to me. Um, like, maybe they were hinting it, but I don't. Yeah, it's, I feel yeah. like they were making googly eyes by episode three. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think it was projected as well as Susan and uh, what's his name from Dalek Invasion of Earth. Hmm. That one you actually saw develop <laughs> over the course of the... Of that the, that uh, was a little more clear. The yeah. other one was just quiet googly yeah. eyes until the very end there. I, I will say a little better than some uh, future companion departure. Oh, that, that's so, so, so true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just um, breakneck like, speed. Well, so you I'm see, this by. man happens to be a soldier and that makes me hot. So I'm going to stay on Gallifrey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, it's just like, wait, what? Where this? What? And then, like, and it's funny because half the time the dudes also, 
just like I don't know so, uh, the way the guy's talking as well just sounds like I'm not sure if you're actually into women but okay I'll go along <laughs> with this I think it might have um, been the skirt <laughs> <laughs> I think for uh, her it might have been also with the skirt <laughs> Every time he had to bend over in that cave, she got a good look. <laughs> All right. Um, Tim. Uh, least favorite scene? Mm-hmm. Okay. My least favorite scene is when uh, Susan is trying to cross that rope bridge, and the other girl just boards on, don't look down. It's like, uh... I wasn't going to look down, but now that you mention it, you know, like, now that you've placed but, the idea in my head, you know, it was like... Thanks for the know, plan, like... Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those contrary things that, you know, is normally human nature. You tell a human being not to think about Don't purple. think about an elephant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and why would you uh, uh, say that when she's like halfway across and then, you know, like, she, do she doesn't need any more distractions. <laughs> All right. Speaking of uh, trying Bill? to make sure that people don't choose uh, or think of something, choose your destructor. <laughs> <laughs> it just popped in there. <laughs> I tried to think about the least... Uh, the least, least dangerous thing, thing, thing you I can think of. <laughs> would never destroy us. Mr. Stay Puff. <laughs> nice thinking, Ray. <laughs> All right, Bill. Mm. All right, so um, I'm just I'm trying to picture how this scene came to be, and I feel like the writer wrote Susan walks past the void without seeing him. <laughs> Carolyn Forn says, "But you made it a straight corridor, and he's literally directly in front of me." And the director says, "Just kind of spin in a circle like you're on <laughs> drugs." And. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you failed. This show is not Assassin's Creed. <laughs> if you don't place yourself against the wall. Uh, oh, yeah, place yourself against the wall, so it's Thief, then. Yeah. It, yeah. It's yeah. It's just like, maybe if I don't look at him, he won't see me. <laughs> well, I'm not even saying the one that she's, like, not being seen by, which that is weird that she just gets looked directly at and ignored. But, like, she allegedly mm. does not see this Vord, who then has yeah. the opportunity to come behind her and stab her. But she's walking directly toward him for most of yeah. that scene. So she has yeah. to spin in the most awkward circle ever to pretend she didn't see him <laughs> yeah. so she can expose her back to him. Yeah. Uh. This is one of those things where if they were allowed to do more than one cut per day, they probably should would have come up with something else. Mm. Um, so mine is also in that first episode. And it's when they drop the board down the pit into the acid lake. <laughs> and it's because it's a horrible take. It's a horrible jump take to uh, from them um, uh, from them trying to shove this guy in, which is happening very awkward and very badly choreographed, to what's mm. obviously a doll falling down a uh, small <laughs> pit into a toilet. That wasn't quite a Wilhelm, right? It was very similar, but I don't think it was. No, it was no, not, it was it was not, not a Wilhelm. Wilhelm. Yeah, it's it's a lot like the scream that the that the knight makes that falls off the cliff mm -hmm. later. Uh... <laughs> oh god, that is like that is so funny. That is like it's so I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't keep from thinking that uh, someone's Captain Scarlet uh, action figure got really soaked. <laughs> oh shit, you flushed! God damn it, I was trying to keep that! <laughs> well, so much for our hero, he's now uh, about the, five feet under the road. You, you talking about the acid reminded me of something else from that episode that pissed me off. And that is just, how is somebody who's been to multiple alien planets by now, including before going to Earth, see, oh, we're on an alien world that we know nothing about. Let me jump into this unknown liquid and assume that it's water. <laughs> no, okay, you know what pisses me off about that episode? 
Here, Susan, you lost your shoe. Take my boots so the so the sand doesn't cut your boots, cut your feet. And then I'm going to walk around for a while on the same sand. <laughs> I noticed that. And I'm like, wait a minute. Shouldn't Ian be dealing with cut feet for most of the cereal then? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess uh, uh, Ian has tougher feet than proof, John McClane. Of course. <laughs> Uh, oh, all by, right by, by the way uh, well, uh, before we move on i wanted to mention back at the uh, favorite scenes the scene where uh the uh doctor and companions are around that building in the first episode is actually really nicely done because if you're watching it really closely you can actually see that they're doing map paintings in the background and they are expertly done compared to some of the other times where we got too close to that wall Are we losing right. connection again? Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, just, just they were really well done, and the, the you can you, you can get proper angles on the painting where there's like an archway and stuff overhead. It just, it's just unusually well done, and, and we've had previous episodes where that wall was a problem. Okay. So it's just nice to see them do a proper set dressing for once. All right. Uh, final thoughts, guys. Matt. Final thoughts. Uh, this is an episode that does not waste its time, but uses every moment it has to keep trying and pushing forward and uh, explain things as best as it can. There are some minor flubs here and there. Matter of fact, there's also some first doctorisms uh, quite frequently in this uh, episode, as I recall. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's a pretty solidly written and well done episode. Uh, it just could maybe use a little bit of a better budget to improve it. All right. Uh, Thomas? Uh, I wasn't really sure what to think going into this, because I don't think I'd s heard many opinions on this story before, and while I wouldn't say it's great, it's at least good. Um, you know, there's like, you know, like all things, there's stuff that could be improved and all that, but the acting was fairly solid, mostly. Just some weird sort of, you know, B movie sci fi stuff that, you know, depending on how much you're either into that or have a tolerance level for that, is going to kill or it, either going to kill some stuff for you or just make you roll with it. Um, like the, the brain slugs. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I am glad that as long as this is, it didn't feel long whereas something like the web planet one of my biggest complaints about that when we covered it was that it felt long <laughs> it was like it's constant so chirping and slow talking people yeah yeah like this but honestly like the fact that they split it up the way they do is what helps because it makes it feel like it's actually taking advantage of this the six episode it, six episodes it has mm-hmm as opposed to Web Planet, which feels like a four-parter that they stretched out to six. Um, uh, which it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. But yeah. Um, uh, I guess, I, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd recommend this. It's not like, you know, all required viewing or anything, but I enjoy it. I also do like that there are at least two or three episodes, it feels like, where even if the Doctor's around... The companions have that much to do that because he's either off doing something else or there's like two episodes where he's just skipped ahead. So they're on their own and they have to sort shit out themselves, which is nice. Um, so yeah, this is a good one. All right. Tim? I thought this was a well-paced episode. I did like how... Uh, there seemed to be a definite plan for the Doctor and all of the companions at any given time, and it wasn't just a case of them wandering off and bumping into things and getting into trouble really and really, like, and that they had a goal. However, I do think there are some philosophical issues to be raised, how that they were originally uh, trying to uh, find the keys to what is uh, basically a brainwashing machine. <laughs> yeah. Machine. And there's no questioning of that either. Yeah, you know, I was thinking, like, uh, this is something that, uh, the new Who Doctors would, uh, like, uh, 
like needs to be convinced to do. Yeah. Well, my well, my well, this mind you, needed to be convinced to do. Well, too. mind you, their initial yeah. response was piss off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then they said, "Hot, well, I've put a force field around your TARDIS, so you can't get in. You have to go collect these keys for me, if you ever want to get in your TARDIS again." Hmm. But I guess it's like there's also no like third Doctor Mind of Evil thing where it's like, well, this is kind of immoral. <laughs> <laughs> to, to he he it. said he mm. he mentions it at the very end, but that's mm. it. Yeah, very yeah. vague last minute I mentioned mm. at the end. But, uh, other than that, I thought this was a pretty cool story. All right, anything else, Tim? Uh, I did like uh, how this uh, planet wasn't just like a planet of like one single thing. Like each ep each mm. area was its own had its own like unique culture and society. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's not something you often see in sci-fi. And and there were multiple mm. climates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wasn't just mm. an entire planet of it's, of it's, uh, it's, glassy it's sand and acid water. It's something that Star Trek is particularly criminal of doing. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. all of their planets are like the same climate? The same mm -hmm. culture. Isn't, isn't the uh, isn't the planet of Hatch trope named after a Star Trek plot, or at Possibly. least, or at least ba mm -hmm. or at least loosely based on the uh, on Star Trek plots? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look at the trope. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Bill, how about you? Um, so I've always found this episode refreshing in that. Um, you know, it's it's an anthology story. It's um like I mentioned earlier, it's the closest we get to a, a a modern pacing of episodes. I mean, we have one episode that's a courtroom drama, and it's not four episodes, it's not three episodes, it's one episode. And there's other things going on that are you know maybe two episodes, but you don't get things drawn out as much. And yeah, the pacing could be a little snappier, but for 1963, it's pretty damn good. Um. The weirdest thing about it, and I did not include this in my complaints because they weren't going to be able to do anything about it otherwise other than maybe uh, take another character and send them on vacation too, was um, it, uh, the oddity of the doctor just, you know, after they barely deal with this one place, the doctor is just like, yeah, I'm going to go off on my own. I'll be perfectly fine. In reality, I'm sure it's because Hartnell needed to go on vacation or have a mm -hmm. sick day or whatever. Yeah, I, I was I was mimicking that earlier. The doctor's just like, okay, I'm going ahead. Smell you later. Boom. <laughs> and yeah, I, I do think it would have made more sense if they had written it so that like Susan went with him just because it would have made more sense. Even, you know, and they could have maybe sent her on vacation too. I don't know. Um, but, you know, that's a pretty minor thing just because it's kind of something they had to do and their filming schedule was ridiculous in the 60s oh yeah they um, had two weeks off yeah so they were doing of, they know. were they were filming 50 weeks a year yep mm -hmm. and it was all week i think pretty much yeah i think it was Unless fine it was, it was it was yeah. it was monday through friday mm. um, so they least have weekends eight to five yep and rehearsing on the weekends if they had the script <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's a pretty good story. It's um, it's not one that I, it's not like one of the things Terry Nation's really known for. Um, but just from some of what we talked about, you know, he gets a lot of stuff right that Doctor Who of this era didn't necessarily get right. So that is something to uh, keep in mind when we otherwise might think of him as a one-trick pony. He does have some skill. Um, oh, Blake Seven, yeah, <laughs> Blake Seven. <laughs> fuck you, he has yeah. skill. <laughs> oh, I, I have no idea. I don't know. I like I'm. He I'm showed. He was showrunner the entire Doctor series. Who. I yeah, did not that... know that. Okay, I never knew that. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't think that's his only one mm -hmm. either. But I'm saying, like, do um, Doctor Who critics tend to sometimes refer to him. Yeah, as, like, sometimes Doctor Who critics funny. think he's a one well, yeah. out, but no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Partially because the the next thing he introduced, I forget if that was the Robots of Death or what, but like. Whatever the next thing he wrote that wasn't Daleks did not catch on very well. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting off the big dumb dot robots. But yeah, that, um, it's a pretty effective episode, and yeah, it gets a lot of stuff right and is enjoyable. And that's it. 
All right. Uh, by the way, he wrote for a lot of shit, but he also was known for Survivors. Um, there, uh, this the mm-hmm. BBC I One series think Survivors. I've read about that. Survivors was Blake that 7. was that the one they were like in a bunker on the on Mars or something? Um, it was a post-apocalyptic drama. Gotcha. Um, hmm. he by the way, he also wrote three episodes of MacGyver. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Uh, was that during the last season? Because the last season was weird. <laughs> uh, 1985. I'm not sure. I don't think so. So that was in the middle of his good run. That, so, was first, okay. that was first season, MacGyver. Wow. There you go. Yeah. He also wrote for the Avengers, the British Avengers, not the uh, okay. Marvel cool. Avengers. Uh, so yeah, he wrote a few good things. So interesting. Anyway, my thoughts on it. So this is a decent serial. The pacing is good. A lot of the episodes are decent. The fifth and sixth are particularly good, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, being the 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 uh, the that the uh, the the stuff that happened on. What was the name of that? Um. What was the name of that city? Oh. Um. Uh. I do not know any of the city names. <laughs> I forget, but it, yeah, the uh, um, the city uh, where they had the trial, Millennius. Millennius. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff on Millennius, I thought, was particularly good. Um, the frozen waste was decent. Uh, some of the puzzling and the the jungle pl- the jungle thing was nice. Uh, really, only episode two I thought was weak, and like I said, that mostly was I think they really need to have their whole hypnosis thing uh, written a little differently because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, acting was fairly good. Um, I didn't like uh, the guy playing Altos. I thought he was a little wooden in his acting, but other than that, I thought. Uh, um, Sabatha did a fairly decent job, and of course, all of our main characters did a good job. Um, and the director took a few interesting shots. I do wish he could have had chances to do some reshooting and a few alternate scenes. But again, 1963 or 1964, you got to deal with it. All in all, I'd say it's fairly decent. So let's go to the rating, shall we? Matt, you give first rating. I give first rating. Oh, also, by the way, another quick mention to the key, the actual uh, key chip uh, props. Those looked really good. Yeah. Um, they mm-hmm. actually look like real chips. Yeah. Um, but they anyway, did a good job on that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, score on this one. I think they're called crisps. <laughs> I'll smack you. Uh, micro, micro crisps. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, I'll give this one. I'm struggling, but I'm going to have to give it a four and a half. (laughs) What what was that, Matt? I'm giving it a four and a half. It's very close. All right. All right. Uh, Thomas. Um, uh, I was almost going to go a bit lower, but honestly, I think the acting's good enough that it elevates some of the bits that are a bit wonky so yeah i'm gonna agree with matt and go 4.5 hmm. all right tim and i shall join the crowd and say 4.5 oh bill well i was not expecting the average to be that high and i think if i were rating it specifically treating 1960s doctor who as its own show i would easily give it a 4.5 But I think holding it to the same standards as the entire show of Doctor Who, which we generally do, I think that edges it down just a bit lower. I'm going to give it a four. And I have to agree on Bill on this one, mostly because of my dislike of episode two. I'm going to give it a four. And between us, that will give it an average of 4.3. 4.3 on the newsy. 
that will still put it fairly high in our rankings. It will put it at number 101 out of 339 things reviewed. It is on par with The Mind of Evil, Empress of Mars, The Unicorn and the Wasp, The Impossible Planet, The Satan Pit, Silence in the Library, Forest of the Dead, Terror of the Autons, The Last Christmas, The Rescue, The Unquiet Dead, The Tenth Planet, um, Demons of the Punjab, Ark in Space, Waters of Mars, this is a big one, Witchfinders, <laughs> Spearhead from Space, it's still going, people. Get on Web of Fear, <laughs> Battle of Grand Score of Kolos, Dalek Invasion of Earth, Ice Warriors. Oh, I'm finally seeing the end. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare and Silver, Three Doctors. There we go. I thought we it usually is, do etc. by now. <laughs> it is I only do etc. on the better and worse thing. It is better than Power of Crawl, Hellbent, Frontier in Space, Destiny of the Daleks, Shakespeare Code, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, etc. See? And worse than the War Games, Terror of the Zygon, Centaur and Stratagem, Poison Sky, Husbands of River Song, Face the Raven, uh, Haunting of the Villa Diodati, etc. So there you go. 101. Out of 339, that is all we have to say about the Keys of Marinus. Ugh. Bill? All right. So uh, we uh, would love to hear what you think below. Uh, were Randy and I too harsh? Was everybody else too loose? Or some combination of the above? Uh, or were we all like. just out of our mind? Yep. Uh, don't, forget to like, don't forget to like or dislike the video if you feel either of those things. And to subscribe to YouTube to keep getting our uh, exported episodes. Or follow us on Twitch to keep seeing our new streams. All right. So next week, we continue with this coverage. Moving on to the very next episode with the Aztecs. Written by John Lucarati and starring William Hartnell as the Doctor, Carolyn Ford as Susan, Jacqueline Hill as Barbara Wright, and William Russell as Ian Chesterton. Funny, they mentioned the Aztecs very briefly in this story. See you all later. <laughs>